parrots are the third most popular pet in the world, but the number one most rehomed. Celebrity parrot trainers Dave and Jamie Womack from Bird Tricks combine nearly four decades of parrot training expertise to help put an end to abandoned parrots as they save parrots one person at a time. Welcome to the Parrot Training Podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Dave and Jamie Womack. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Parrot Training Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Womack, and here with my beautiful wife, Jamie Lee, <laughs> from Bird Tricks. Guys, today we're talking about a topic called energy training. Now, we first discovered this a while ago, have put it into play in a couple of different applications, and the underlying concept that I think we took away from it is that parrots not only learn, and this is important to realize, parrots learn whatever behavior you're trying to train them, they pair it with the emotional state that they feel in that time. So if you're training the rock out, we were accidentally putting angry on cue, and you can modify that later, which we'll talk about. So it's important to, one, raise awareness for your own energy when you're training, but also to be aware that you can actually train the animal to do something intentionally based on your energy and your intention. Sounds crazy, right? Yeah, and for those of you that don't know the behind the scenes story of the rock out, the rock out now is a really cute behavior that we have our female Galah Bondi do. We, well, Dave really cues it in the show. Um, she puts her wings completely spread out. She rolls her head in multiple circles and she does a whistle all at the same time. And it's what we call the rock out. And how I originally trained that was I just saw her do the head rolling movement at a mirror. And it was aggressive, and right? And it was aggressive. Like she wanted to attack the other Gala in the mirror. And it was when I would have her in the dressing room with me while I applied my makeup for our show. And I noticed she was getting madder and madder at the bird in the mirror. But the head roll itself was really cute. So I started clicking and rewarding to put it on cue. So that's kind of where this whole thing is stemming from is that I eventually had to transition that aggression training, putting aggression on cue with the head nod or the head roll um, to eventually pairing it with a happy emotion. Yeah, so here's a background story, guys. There's, uh, you all know that we entertain for a living. We perform all over the world with our birds. They're our family, they're our life. And we worked with a beautiful Swainson toucan, toucan named Fiji. She toured all over with us for six years. In fact, she was essentially Jamie's and my first child in a weird <laughs> way, right? So, so we understand everybody that comes from that background of like, you know, you have the best interests in mind for your, for your bird. And so we got her as a little baby. We raised her. We toured with her. I think the estimate was about 20 countries. And she just was, was an incredible joy in our lives. And we put her into a show. Now, the trick was very simple. There was kind of a wonky looking cage on stage. She was supposed to jump into the cage. And that was it. That was all the cueing, the magic that she had to do. She had to go in the cage. And I had somebody select a card from a jumbo deck of playing cards. And that would go inside the cage with her. And I'd cover a little curtain on the front. It would roll down. And then, as if by magic, the bird all of a sudden throws out all the playing cards. And these jumbo cards go flying everywhere. And then... I'm like, hey, what are you doing? And then she shreds up on the newspaper that was in there. So shreds of newspaper go flying everywhere. So I open it up, she hops out, flies over to me, and I reach in and pull out, and she had actually chewed, quote unquote, the selected card out of the newspaper. And it was a very cute routine, and it was a fun way to showcase an amazing bird in a way that did stuff she was naturally good at. It was easy for her to jump into a box. It was easy for her to fly to me. So we built that routine around what she did naturally. So we did this all over the world. I mean, literally 20 countries, as I mentioned. And one of the tours that we were on, unfortunately, there was a gas leak in one of the arenas that, uh, that led to her death. And we were devastated. We also counted our blessings, too, because we had taken the rest of the birds that day and flew them around the inside of the arena. Um, it was, we got very lucky that we didn't have all the birds die in that situation. That being said, we came back to discover her lifeless body inside of this cage, and I, I was a wreck. But because we're in show business, you've all heard it, the show must go on. I mean, I've literally been across the street at a hospital with an IV in my arm, and it's five or ten minutes before the show's supposed to start, and I unplugged from the IV, I covered up with my costume, went, did the show, finished the show, went back, plugged the IV back in. I mean... The show goes on no matter what, and this was no different. We had to go on and do our show. So how, one, do we replace a five-minute routine that we had been doing for six years with a bird that had been trained for six years, 
and and how do you how do you meet the caliber that that was at? And oh, by the way, to your shows tonight. And not that it was a hard, complicated trick, but it was, and when we do put birds in our shows, it's catered to what they like to do naturally. So she was just naturally really great at that. Some other birds wouldn't like doing that naturally. Yeah. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't make a routine around that. <laughs> So we were exposed to this whole idea of, okay, wow, these birds really feel our own energy because I, I grabbed Bondi, who was our second child, and, <laughs> and we had trained her from a baby as well. And so I thought, okay, cool. I'm going to put Bondi in. It'll be super easy. I can show off her rock out. I can do these other tricks. All she has to do is go into this, bro this little box with a little curtain in the front and then come out. I don't even have to have her fly. That's it. Super easy. My energy was so toxic to her that she wanted nothing to do with me. And... It wasn't like this desire for her to come comfort me. It was just no. she, if I set her on the side of the prop, she'd fly to the ground and try to walk away. If I went to try to pick her up, she'd fly further. She wanted nothing to do with me. And I remember Jamie saying like, hey, Dave, calm down. It's your energy. And she could see it from the outside eye. You hear us talk about this all the time. Like sometimes it's really good to have an extra trainer who can see something. And even though we're both, you know, kind of professional trainers, we've been doing this together now for 15 years and I had about five years jump start on that. So collectively 35 years of training, we still use that outside eye. And she could see that, okay, Bondi is not responding to my energy. And, and you brought this up last time we talked about this, how, you know, when, when in that situation, you can't both grieve at the same time. Yeah. And I think a lot of people relate to that. If you're in a relationship with somebody and you both lose something, like for us, we both lost Fiji but you kind of broke down first and oh, mourned first. And my immediate shock was, was bigger and greater, um, but I think I was in such shock that it hadn't sunk in, whereas it sunk in immediately for Dave. And I was still looking for ways to bring her back. I was not convinced. It was, I, it was over, I hadn't accepted it. And he went into mourning immediately and he was this toxic, dark hole is the only way that I could really describe it. And then when he finally started to come out of that is when I let myself break down and feel and grieve as well. And I think that a lot of couples out there take turns grieving because one person has to hold everything together while the other person can have the opportunity to break down. I think that's just yeah. a normal thing that people do in life. It's how we survive. So in that kind of false stage, you know, I was, she would, as soon as I realized like, okay, it's my energy. I went from like, oh man, life's awful to, all right, Vonda, come on, let's go. And like, I tried everything <laughs> to try to pretend to be happy. And I genuinely wasn't yet. And it didn't matter. She could still feel that. But since Jamie wasn't quite there yet, uh, and we, I just literally yesterday came across some old footage of Jamie. You could tell that her eyes were bloodshot from crying and, and, tried to train him on. I was a little bit more receptive to you, but still wasn't very responsive. And so the interesting thing about this is in, in that moment, we realized, okay, the birds feel our energy. So the question is immediately, how does that affect our everyday training? Are you the kind of person who's always happy? Are you the kind of person who's really, really hyper all the time and wondering why your bird can't calm the heck down? Or are you somebody who is depressed for one reason or another, right? Are you somebody who's just like, mopey and is your bird not responding to you well maybe your bird doesn't want to be with you because you've got toxic energy on the other hand the total opposite side maybe your bird doesn't want to be with you because you have way too much energy all the time and stress it out now there's different types of birds that different energies fit better with right and and i think that's important to realize but then we decided to take it a step further so as i mentioned in the beginning every Every single time you train a behavior, the bird's pairing that behavior with the emotion. So back to the rock out, it started as I'm aggressive, my head's rolling in circles, I wanna kill that bird in the mirror because I have no idea it's me. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it was this aggressive behavior. And then we had to try to slowly change it and make it fun by, by adding that fun energy because we realized that she was responsive to that. Now the challenge with this is when Jamie trained this, one of the reasons we had the unique behavior of the rock out was because Another rule, we don't talk about this very much, but you shouldn't train two or three tricks at the same time because they meld them together. The bird gets confused. Yeah. Which I learned <laughs> because I thought it would be super cool to train her to put her wings out right after, well, not even right after. I hadn't really finished the head roll yet. 
So I tried teaching the wings out pretty much right next door and they meshed together. And man, the timing with that clicker, if you guys have ever used a clicker and you've ever messed it up, which you most likely have if you've ever used a clicker, because it's so easy to do, um, you click what you get, as Dave says. So I accidentally clicked when she both had her wings out and rolled her head. And that's what I got. It was an accident. It was a total amazing accident. It's a subtle difference, but you get what you click. What did I say? You click what you get. Did I really? It was close. It was oh my close. gosh! <laughs> oh man, it was right in my head. Oh, it's too bad we're not editing this. <sighs> well, what do you do? You click what you get. You click what you get. <laughs> you get what you click. Oh my gosh, it sounds the same. So you that's what. what you get. So that's what ended up, ended up happening, and then we had to change it into a fun, uh, a fun emotion, right? Which isn't the whole point of this, but if you train too many things too close together, you pair that emotion with it, and they also they blend it together. So we got this really cool behavior, and then she added her own whistle to it, which is, it just makes it cuter. Sorry, I'm stuck on my click what you get. Yeah. Get what you click. Get what you click. Which one? It's get what you click. <laughs> God, I'm so, and now my brain just, I can't take it. If you guys want to see more of this click. madness, check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash bird tricks. It's, yeah, if anybody wants to see me mess stuff. up, what did I say? Cons and pros. Just <laughs> thumbs up for cons and con your video. <laughs> you guys, just. You know, you know right. what I mean, right? <laughs> so, okay, so now we try to take this whole behavior and take it a step further because she had paired it with the cue, rock out! And I didn't really want to be on stage in, you know... Looking it, all manly. And, and being like, hey everybody, welcome to the show, check it out, here's a trick, rock out! <laughs> it just, it didn't really fit my, my vibe, if you know what I'm saying. So... I think it fits. Uh, it doesn't fit. And so... I decided that I was going to try to change this. And so I tried to lower my voice and, and she would do it a little bit, but it was missing something. And so what I did is I started to put all of my body language, all my intention, every bit of my being was, hey, I want you to do the rock out. And so I eventually threw, okay, so I Simon says her, right? I would go rock out. She would do it. And all the intention is still there. I do it again, rock out. And then she still had that intention. And, and I still had the intention, she still did it. The third time, I did everything the same with the intention, and she did it. So I clicked, because you click what you get. And so I started to find- You just totally threw me off, I'm like, you click what you get. No, you get what you click. You know what? So I started to pair my emotion and my intention as the cue, rather than the high-pitched voice. And now to this point, to this day, she actually does that behavior when I'm holding her and I give the intention. I think it, everything about my being is, I want you to do this. And my energy also matches that, that everything except for the vocal tone is still there and she does it. And we mess around with it being, okay, is it my hand cue? Is it, you know, am I like winking at her and I don't realize, or what is it that Your I might eyeballs. be doing? Yeah, do do Tusa, Tusa? Tusa says hello and I kind of bug my eyes out at it. It's, <laughs> it's pretty funny, he's like, hello. Uh, anyway, so so there's a situation or an example of how we intentionally put my energy as the cue to the trick. So my deeper question to you, do you have something that you're doing naturally that is causing, for better or for worse, a behavior to happen with your bird? This could easily happen with screaming. Your bird may respond. Keep in mind, if reinforcement increases behavior, whether it's plus or minus reinforcement, to simplify it, or positive or negative reinforcement, but if it's plus or minus reinforcement, it's still going to increase that behavior. If it's punishment, it's going to decrease that behavior. So if nothing is changing and your bird is screaming, and every time the bird screams, you get just pissed off and the bird continues to scream. Especially if you have neighbors or your your bird has to be quiet for a certain reason, like the baby's sleeping or people are over or whatever it is. I know for me personally, I get really anxious when I know we were in a situation where our toucan was in the backyard and anytime he would croak, it drove our neighbor <laughs> mad. And in all so, fairness, a dove cooing drove the neighbor mad. Okay, yes. But a squirrel in the backyard with a white chest that he hadn't seen before. He thought it was ours. We brought it home from an exotic vacation, put it in his backyard to make him mad. But the croaking. Yeah. Um, so anytime, and, and honestly, it was something that I never noticed. Uh, Rocco's croaking, I just, it didn't play at a certain level for me. I just didn't notice it. But once I realized that it bothered our neighbors so much, 
I started tuning in and anytime I heard it, I got immediately anxious and stressed out and there was nothing that I could do to calm Rocco down because now my energy was projecting like, Wah! you know, it was almost yeah. making it worse because I was so anxious about it and that it had to stop right then and there before we got in trouble or pissed somebody off or, or whatever. And so I think a lot of people have those natural reactions or have those sounds that are just like nails on a chalkboard that drive us yeah. nuts. And there's certain sounds for me that our birds make that I'm like, oh, I gotta... Whew. Got to reel it in. Yeah. And so there's there's definitely things, jumping back to reinforcement or punishment, there's things you are likely doing that might be accidentally reinforcing the bird. And like infrared waveforms, okay, you and I can't see those. The naked eye can't see infrared, birds can. I have the theory and the feeling and the belief that our energy is also something that the birds pick up on. There's a, there's a great example, okay, so I had heat stroke and I was in the hospital in Brooklyn, which I don't ever recommend being in the hospital in Brooklyn. My doctor pushed me out in the hallway, forgot about me, signed off, went home, and I'm trying to communicate, hey, I know, it's a true story, guys. I'm trying to communicate this back and forth to Jamie from a text messaging, and she's back, I, I think you guys ended up doing the second show that day anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. So they're still doing the second show, and uh, and I'm trying to relay like, hey, I don't know what's going on. She's, she's I could tell she's angry through text messaging, right? Like it's, it's almost like she was pushing the buttons harder, and I could just tell. So I don't know that she's coming to the hospital. I have no clue of this. But I'm sitting there with my fifth IV looking like the Michelin man, blown up from way too many fluids. <laughs> and I'm in the hallway and I feel this like intense presence, right? Mind you, there's probably 300 people moving around in this hospital. I can't see any lights, I can't, uh, any, any daylight, I should say. I can't see windows, I can't see doors, but there is a super intense presence. I could feel Jamie walking closer <laughs> to me. She yanks out the IVs, <laughs> takes me out, we sign the papers, we go home, and, uh, but I could feel her presence when she entered the building. So if I could feel that presence from 100 <laughs> yards away, imagine the presence that your bird feels if there's a death in the family, if you're going through a divorce or a breakup, if you have a toxic energy from any reason, if the doctor forgot about you, whatever that reason is, your bird is very perceptive and likely picking up on that. So the bigger, deeper question this is I challenge you guys to find situations in your bird's life and in your life that might be triggering or accidentally reinforcing or accidentally punishing your bird's behavior. Yeah, and I think that you guys are going to, probably just through listening to this, are thinking about times when your birds were receptive or non-receptive to your energy, whether they wanted everything to do with you or absolutely nothing to do with you. Because yeah. the other side is apparent as well. And I got a lot of comments on energy type related training when I worked with Morgan. People said that they saw an immediate connection and it was my energy with her. And sometimes my cues and things were just based on our connection. And I would always joke to Dave that I sound like a hippie when I'm talking about my training of Morgan because I was all about vibes and feelings and <laughs> this and that. And I, I had a really hard time articulating exactly what I was doing because it was just this this like electric it was an energy yeah well that wraps up our time today guys thank you so much for listening to the parrot training podcast like always if you love this give us a thumbs up leave your comments if you're watching this on YouTube please leave a comment saying what you think it is that might be accidentally reinforcing or punishing your birds we'd love to go through those comments and give you some feedback too or just read what your stories are and and then let that help other people discover it as well uh, also, if you do leave a uh, comment on iTunes, take a screen capture, send it to info at birdtricks.com because we are going to be giving away all sorts of amazing prizes uh, based on that as your entry form. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next week on the Parrot Training Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Parrot Training Podcast with Dave and Jamie Womack. New episodes released every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast.